So uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Christian Schiffer. I'm a PhD student in the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine at Research Center Jülich in the big data analytics group, group uh, led by Timo Dickscheid and I, I will talk about some recent, recent advances that we made in automated whole brain mapping of human cyto architecture with deep learning. Um, so this will be a very um, high level overview talk um, where I will present uh, where we'll just give an overview of our several methods that we developed in the last years. If you are interested in any specific method or several methods, just feel free to reach out to me uh, during the workshop or tomorrow during the poster session. Um, I will be happy to, to give more details. Um, so these met methods are not necessarily specific to the big brain, but especially for the big brain, um, they really show their full potential uh, as, you will, as you will see uh, in a second. Um, so, I'm sure a lot of a lot of you will be familiar with with cyto architecture or cyto architectonic brain mapping, but to have a common foundation, I will um, will just start with a with a short introduction on this. So, as cyto architecture, we understand the the spatial organization of neuronal cells in the in the, in the cortex specifically here, and um, for so for example, the the distribution orientation of or presence of certain cell types. And based on cytoarchitecture, we can identify so-called cytoarchitectonic uh, areas, which are regions in the brain which share some um, common cytoarchitectonic properties. Uh, and these are interesting because um, cytoarchitecture can often be an indicator for, for connectivity and function. So they are interesting to identify um, to, to better understand the structure and the function of the brain. Um, currently, these areas are identified using uh, a semi-automatic method, which is um, mostly based on statistics and image processing, and it works by identifying borders between between areas, as we see here in the um, in the image. For example, the border between the primary and the secondary visual cortex. Uh, the issue with this method is that it's not scalable to very large numbers of sections. So, if we think about the big brain. Um, it's not possible um, to map all the 7,400 uh, sections of the big brain using this, uh, using this method. And this big problem becomes even more, more prominent when we think about the large amounts of data that we can acquire with, with today's hardware. So this is where we come into play. So uh, we are working on developing um, approaches to, um, to some degree or hopefully someday fully automate the mapping uh, using machine learning. And as you might have guessed from the, from the title, our method of choice here is um, deep learning. Um, uh, in deep learning, we are mostly concerned with so-called um, neural networks, often also called artificial neural networks, um, which are basically parameterized uh, differentiable functions. And uh, these functions are optimized to produce uh, wanted outputs or given inputs, basically. So if we have a look at on the left here, our inputs might be small patches extracted from, from the cortex and the brain. Then we pass these patches to a model and, um, um, and let it uh, predict the area this specific patch belongs to. And we can then optimize the parameters of the function with a large enough data set um, so that the model is in the end able to, uh, to classify also new patches and then in this way um, automate the mapping process. Why are we using deep learning here? Of course, there are also a lot of other machine learning approaches, but uh, it, has to, it has shown that deep learning is particularly useful when we are dealing with very complex tasks on high dimensional data. So as soon as we are dealing with images or speech or text, deep learning is typically a good, uh, good method of choice. Um, first steps of deep learning for brain mapping um, uh, have been done by my former colleague, Hannah Spitzer. Uh, who formulated brain mapping as a classification problem, as I just, just outlined. So uh, for each, for, for a patch extracted from the cortex, we want to classify which brain area it belongs to. Um, and Hannah um, conducted a very nice feasibility study on, um, in this case, 13 areas from the visual systems system, and um, her results showed um, that deep learning as a method is actually very, very promising for this task but also that the problem is really challenging. For example, because um, the, the patterns that we need to identify to, to classify cyber architecture are very complex and ambiguous, and also the va variability across brains 
but also due to different histological processing steps um, can be quite large. Uh, Hanna also showed that um, incorporating prior information, for example, in the form of probabilistic atlas information, uh, can drastically improve results. And also that pre-training the model on a related task for which we can gain much more training data can help to improve performance. So after this first study, uh, we learned that deep learning is actually worth investigating um, uh, further. Um, and we then went, went to... Um, went over to try to put this into something which can already be used in practice to support mappers. So here, our goal was to build something which can, in, to some, with, with as little um, manual work as possible, enable large-scale brain mapping. And our idea here was that instead of trying to build one supermodel, super neural network, which can uh, predict a lot of brain areas and a lot of different brains, um, we, um, we build highly specialized neural network models. These models are trained on annotations of only one selected brain area. So for example, the primary visual cortex, which are created in only two, two spatially closed sections of one brain. And with this, the model learns, um, the model specializes quite much on one specific brain, one brain area, and also one spatial region of the brain. But it turns out that by uh, restricting ourselves so much on one specific subtask, we can improve performance quite much. And we can repeat this whole process um, for large series of sections and also for sections and also for, for, for multiple areas to, in the end, cover really large extents of sections. Um, we integrated this uh, approach already into an internal prototype web application where neuroscientists can create annotations. Of a, of a wanted area, and then at the push of a button, train, the mod, train a model and observe the results. And in particular, um, we, uh, we demonstrated that this method works quite well uh, for the big brain, where we, um, where we used it to map the entire extent of areas HLC1, 2, 3, V, 5, and even some more areas which are not listed here, um, which are subcortical areas. Um, and after, after fully mapping these areas, we projected them into the, into the 3D reconstructed big brain. And um, by that obtained um, these nice high resolution 3D maps of cyto architecture uh, here in the video, seen here in the video, and also here in the top left um, shown in the, in the viewer of the, of the human brain project. So this was, um, after the initial feasibility study, the first step into a really practical, usable tool um, to support neuroscientists. After that, we took, so to say, one step back and focused again on um, trying to build a model which can be applied um, just to any kind of new data, which is very convenient. So uh, the, the big goal of having a neural network which can just predict cyto architecture when, when it's given new data. And for this, we gathered a, quite a large data set, which consists of 2000, about 2,200 sections from eight brains and 130 brain areas. And in addition to using so much data, um, uh, we also used a sophisticated, more sophisticated uh, training procedure, which is called um, contrastive learning. And without going into too much technical detail here, um, I want to say that this, this method learns to map uh, images extracted from the cortex to compact representations uh, which are similar for images which are extracted from the same area and dissimilar for images which are extracted from the from different areas. So it basically disentangles, projects images into a dis disentangled space, uh, which can then be used to um, classify cyto architecture quite nicely. And it turns out that this using this training procedure actually improves uh, classification performance and all and these the, the learned features also form semantically meaningful clusters. So as we see here on the left, for example, the primary visual cortex has one quite dedicated cluster, higher visual areas cluster together. And this is actually what we want when we are doing cyto architecture classification. Uh, as a side note, these um, all these, these trainings that we are doing here are very computationally intensive. So we use high performance computing for all of, all of the things we do here. Um, and to give an example, training just one of these models and we 
typically train train a lot of them takes four hours on 64 of um, one of the most advanced gpus that is available today so it's not only um, uh, challenging from a methodological point of view but also uh, quite quite interesting from a tech technical point of view um, in the next step um, on the search to um, to further improve performance uh, we revisited how we formulated the problem and we found that um, in the current setting the the problem was quite ill posed in some way because in all previous approaches approaches we were only looking at um, the model was, was always tasked to classify Saito architecture by only looking at a very small image patch extracted from the cortex. And this is somehow unfair because this is also not, also, um, uh, not how, how neuroscientists typically do it. You cannot classify Saito architecture properly in most cases by just looking at a small 2D image patch without having any, any context. Um, and with context, I mean information about the surrounding tissue, information about adjacent sections, or maybe also the position in the brain. The problem is that it's not so trivial to, uh, to incorporate this context, because for this, you would need a very, very high resolution 3D reconstruction at the, at the cellular level, which is typically not available. So um, what we did instead, uh, we used an approach based on, um, on graph neural networks, which are a special kind of neural network which can operate on graphs. So not on images, but for example, on, uh, in this case on graphs. Um, and our approach looked like this. We, um, we first computed a very coarse reconstruction from consecutive brain sections. So uh, just a rigid alignment of, of brain sections and computed a mid-surface um, mesh through the cortex, which you see here on the left. And the trick here is that we can assign, uh, that we can identify each point on the mesh with one unique point within a 2D image. And um, what we can do with this, uh, with this uh, in mind is that we can compute, that we can use the, the previous method to compute um, feature vectors encoding Saito architecture in the image domain and assign these feature vectors to the mesh, which is, which is visualized here. So each node in the mesh now has a, has a vector assigned to it, which encodes something about the Saito architecture. And in, this, and in addition to these Saito architectonic features, we can also assign um, some other features, as many as we want. So for example, spatial coordinates or information from a probabilistic atlas. Um, and after doing this, uh, we can use uh, graph neural networks to efficiently um, process these meshes and perform classification of each node. And this method has shown to, to work really well because it allows us to combine the high resolution information which we can extract from the from the from the images with the 3d topological information that um, uh, that is encoded in the graph without having access to a, a extremely precise 3d reconstruction so to summarize um, we had made quite some some progress in the task for automatic site architecture classification um, uh, but of course, there, there are some, some remaining challenges. So um, the performance is still not sufficient to fully automate the mapping. So that's, it's not, not yet a, a fire and forget approach. And in particular, um, the transferability to, to new brains needs to be improved. So as soon as we are looking at brains which are, which are completely unseen during the training process, performance uh, drops, and we are still in the process of investigating why, why this happens. Uh, in future work, we will most likely um, go a little bit more into the, the direction of unsupervised feature learning, because currently all, all uh, what we do is we are trying to replicate what the annotations by neuroscientists tell us, which in principle is a good idea, but uh, an unsupervised approach which learns something about Saito architecture could potentially enable also a more data-driven um, approach or data-driven study of Saito architecture. So you can think of, for example, um, clustering within these features for discovery um, of new areas. But we are still working on this and we are not, uh, have not yet uh, finally decided how we, how we will do this. Um, and with this, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to close. As I said, um, it was, this, is, this was a quite, um, quite high level talk. And if you're interested in any more details, just reach out to me or, or um, approach me during the, during the poster session. And if there's any time left, I will be happy to, to answer some questions um, also now. And thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Christian, for your for your nice presentation. Uh, as I know, you have a poster session, uh, poster booth tomorrow, so we can maybe transfer those those questions. Yeah. There, we can have maybe one question uh, from the audience. I see some uh, hands are being raised. So, um, if there is anybody from the audience who wants to ask the question, please go ahead now. And and if not, uh, I have I have uh, quite a few questions, but I will constrain just maybe to to one um, quick question. How, what was the resolution of the data you were you were working on? Is this one micron, twenty micron? Um, so if you classify it like this, it's uh, it's one micron, but for technical reasons, we have to downscale to two micron. But it's it's high resolution, so it's it's higher resolution than twenty micron because we need to be able to really see individual cells. In case we would would like to use one micron, but this is just beyond the capabilities of uh, of computers at the moment. Right, right. And I'll interpose a, a quick question. Uh, you mentioned eight brains that you were using. Can the uh, can deep learning uh, match or distinguish which brain the uh, samples were taken from? Yeah, this is a really good question. So this is actually what we what we um, what we uh, tested to to better understand also why we have these um, these performance drops when going to to new brains. And at the moment, you can train a linear classifier, for example, on the learned features to very well distinguish the brains. So it it's uh, it's quite good at uh, Recognize so that would be interesting in terms of maybe a typical, a so-called typical brain or something. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for, for, for the question. Um...